A few years ago, I took part in one of the stranger activities that I have voluntarily submitted myself to. I went down to the Thames Foreshore near Hammersmith and spent the best part of an hour on, um, I think it was Saturday morning, digging up other people's used wet wipes. Uh, this was part of Thames 21's Big Wet Wipe Count 2018. What it is, is this charity gets a large group of volunteers together to go down to the foreshore and we're each given a single square meter quadrant and you measure how many wet wipes you can pick up uh, in that area and I think we're all in sort of groups of four. I was amazed to find, looking back just now, that we pulled up 250 wet wipes just in that single square meter on the Thames Riverbank and most people would not be aware that they're there at all uh, if you walk past it. In total, just in that morning, Thames 21 found 5,000 wet wipes in an area half the size of a tennis court, which is remarkable. Um, it's a quirk of the fact that London, for all its many innovations, and as much as the Thames has got a lot cleaner in recent years, the sewers still overflow if there's a particularly large amount of rain. And even though you're not meant to put wet wipes uh, down the toilet, people still do and they end up washed up um, on the riverbank. I think more distressingly than this very grisly activity of actually pulling them up and being so close to this stuff was actually, if you stood on the other side of the riverbank, you could see um, just how these wet wipes had basically created their own landscape. So there were so many of them, there's now hundreds of thousands of these wet wipes, that they'd compacted and compacted and created these sort of mounds which you'd assume were a natural part of the river but they were not, they're, they're all, it's all made of wet wipe. Um, obviously the big wet wipe count did not take place this year for obvious reasons. Um, I can only assume it's going to happen in future years and um, although I've made it sound um, kind of disgusting I, I really recommend doing it because the, the data is very important. Um, I've put together this episode just to flag a few citizen science projects which I've been aware of in the last few years. Um, they're mostly ones that you can still do, so you can go and do them by yourself and not get in anyone's way or break any rules, depending on where you live, of course. Um, there's some that you can do at your desk. There's some that's probably good just to go out and do a walk uh, or that kind of thing. It's just logging insects uh, and taking photographs. Um, I hope you find this useful, uh, and I hope you choose to do a few of these. Perhaps you're the kind of person who likes to get up at four in the morning. Uh, or maybe you like birdsong. Ideally, if you're both, the Dawn Chorus website might be the citizen science project that you have been waiting for. It was created by a professor, Michael Gorman, of the Biotopia Museum uh, in Munich, Germany. And it's a very simple principle. He realised that lockdown meant that cities are quite a lot quieter, and it would be the ideal time for people to record birdsong where they live. And so the website's asking you to put a device outside, typically your phone, and record the birdsong that occurs right where you live and stick it on the website. Uh, where it'll be used for, for research. Uh, in the last month, they've managed to get 3,000 bird songs uploaded onto this website, which is really incredible. And The Guardian this weekend is profiling one of them. It was recorded in uh, Carsholton, which is here in the UK. And it's really interesting because you get to identify which birds are appearing when. So it begins with uh, blackbirds and robins at about 4.20. It then progresses to pigeons. Uh, and then, of course, the rather annoying and loud uh, ring-necked parakeets start um, making all sorts of noises. Um, they're yet to progress down to the southwest of England, so we've been spared that particular invasive species so far. Um, so there's a lot that you can learn, and there's a lot that the wider scientific community can learn by doing this. So absolutely um, do some recording and upload it to that website. Now, one of the absolute standout citizen science projects of recent years has to be the iNaturalist app. It's a great little tool. You can download it onto your phone. Uh, you can also use it on your desktop. 
Quite simply, you take a picture of something that you've observed outside, an insect or a bird or plant or fungus, whatever it happens to be. You then put it onto this website, put the date and the location of where you have seen this, and then other people on that website will help you identify it if you don't know what it is. Um, you can also put up your suggestion of what you think it might be. It is, if you're like me and you, you like spreadsheets and categorizing things um, almost as much as you like insects, then it is, it's like catnip. It can be quite kind of addictive. I logged in earlier to see that the site was promoting someone who had observed a thresher shark, uh, which is a spectacular looking kind of shark, um, jumping out of the water, uh, which made my observations about red-tailed bumblebees look slightly less exciting. Um, but I also saw that near where I live, someone had observed a fungus called the trooping crumble cap, which grows on trees and uh, looks kind of interesting. So again, that's the original reason for having the app was to, you know, that's now something that I can go look at and other people who are using the app can go and see. It actually started as a master's project, which just goes to show if perhaps if you're on a master's right now, um, you could well be on the verge of creating something this useful. Um, it's unlikely, but I don't know, give it a go. I, the other thing I would say about it is, unlike some other projects, you don't need to kind of appear for it for an hour. There's not sort of a set time frame or set location or anything like that. It's not that taxing. You can. It's kind of a, a complement to your daily walk or however often you get out. You can kind of pick it up and drop it as and when you like. So very satisfying thing to have. And um, I would urge you to download it if you don't already have it. So today, as I am recording this, I'm in the southwest of England and the temperature is sort of in the mid 20s and the pollen count is now VH for very high. Um, this means that I'm stuck indoors and if, like me, you suffer from the high pollen count and going around counting insects is off the agenda, good news, you can in fact do a lot of these projects from your desk. Uh, conveniently, there is a website called Zooniverse, fantastic name, and a, a myriad of projects on there where you can help research teams count animals and uh, observe their photographs, uh, look at documents, and help them along with their with their work. One of the most eye-catching projects on there is Penguin Watch. It's as wonderful as it sounds, you get to log in and basically just look at pictures of penguins for as long as you like. There's about 15,000 people who've logged in there and done that and made 750,000 classifications in the process. The idea is to try and get a better picture of why penguin populations are in decline, typically in, in remote regions. So you log in, you're given a selection of pictures to look at, and typically, depending on the project, you tag things like, this is an adult penguin, this is a chick, this is an egg. Um, so it's not too taxing, and the people who run this project, uh, who are based at the University of Oxford, uh, they reckon that anyone above the age of five uh, can make a contribution. So it might be worth something that uh, school children uh, can look into uh, and do. And it's a, a, a very wholesome uh, activity. The people running it think it's now about 97% uh, complete and the success of Penguin Watch has spawned uh, a sister project called Seal Watch. Seal Watch again is a, a similar concept. It's, it's hard to analyse the lives of animals that live in, in regions that are difficult to get to and difficult for researchers to spend significant amounts of time in. So what you're doing on that website is, is a similar thing. You're tagging time lapse and drone uh, photographs. Um, that site has just over 2,000 volunteers, but it's only 2% complete. So um, definitely worth getting, getting on there and, and sorting that out. If seals and penguins are not your thing, and that's entirely possible, then there's also parts of the website where you can look at things like the Western Burrowing Owl uh, or Beluga Whales in Churchill River. Uh, there's also a 
fascinating project run by the Natural History Museum in London called Project Plumage. Um, they're inviting people to look at the enormous collection they have of uh, taxidermied birds. The aim of the project is to get a better understanding of the extent of bird coloration across all 10,000 living bird species. Now, bearing in mind that we've, there's been this relatively recent discovery that birds can also see in ultraviolet light as well as visible light, you'd be doing uh, the museum uh, and our general understanding of uh, biodiversity uh, a huge favour by uh, helping with that. It would also be silly of me to not mention, uh, while I'm talking about the Natural History Museum, uh, not to bring up the big seaweed search. This is a project the museum does in collaboration with the uh, Marine Conservation Society here in the UK. It's much as it sounds. You go down to your beach, and again, you can incorporate this into a beach walk uh, or other activity you might be planning anyway. Take their survey with you. Uh, and their guide to UK uh, seaweed species. And you just need to survey a, a stretch of beach that, that you can sort of allocate yourself, um, look at the species that you see occurring down the uh, foreshore, and send that information back to the museum. Uh, the aim of this particular project is to get a grip of uh, the extent of ocean acidification of which um, seaweed health is, is a marker. Uh, you're also looking out for invasive species, so a lot of this is, you're looking for native uh, species, but also um, species that are, are moving here as a consequence of, of climate change. And I've, I've actually done this one. I went down to the Severn Estuary, uh, which is what counts as coast in this um, part of the world, and I had a little look and found a, just a huge amount of channeled rat. So perhaps not the most exciting find, but the good news was that on, on my particular trip, I wasn't seeing much of these uh, climate change markers, which the museum uh, and the Marine Conservation Society are concerned about us finding. <laughs> I'm going to quickly bounce over to another great British institution, and that is the Royal Botanic Gardens of Kew. Unsurprisingly, they have a whole range of fantastic citizen science uh, projects. Um, you can read the 19th century letters of Sir Joseph Dalton Hooker uh, and help the museum transcribe those. You can go into the herbarium uh, collection the, and the fungarium collections. Um, I've actually uh, done that myself. Um, it's a very satisfying thing to do. You get to just spend uh, however, as long as you like, uh, just looking at these uh, old volumes, cataloguing the um, the expeditions that various Q researchers have done um, in the past. Um, and while we're on the subject of Q, their gardens are actually opening um, in the coming week. So if you can, um, I think there's some sort of um, in-out system, but um, worth checking that out. So, in summary, there is a huge amount you can go and do. You don't even have to leave the comfort of your own home, and you can be contributing to incredibly valuable scientific projects run by the best institutions in the world, um, from your garden, from your desk, on your walk, at the beach. Uh, there's endless possibilities, and I, I would urge you to give one of them a try. <laughs>